Hey guys, welcome to the Choose Fi Radio Podcast, January 1st, 2018, first podcast episode of the year, and I am so excited to be giving you this particular episode today. Let me go ahead and even take one step back and say that back in episode 30, we brought Alan Donegan on to show us what was missing in the conversation. And in our mind, it was that we weren't doing a good enough job talking about the value of starting a business or a side hustle. That episode was mind-blowing. It's so good. You need to go listen to it first. Do not listen to this episode if you have not yet listened to episode 30 of the podcast. Stop this right now. Go listen to episode 30. And then if you go listen to the Friday Roundup, which was 30R, Alan basically hosted a contest and he said, I offer this coaching, but I do it as a group with different communities all around the world. For your community, I would love to offer a single person one-on-one coaching we can record it and then play it for the audience. That way everybody can get access to this information. It can help as many people as possible. So obviously we went all in on that. We had so many people from our community you know, come in, pitch their different ideas. And what was really cool is we had our Facebook group vote on which one they wanted to see actually win this contest. Talis won, and we have recorded our first coaching session with her and Alan, and we're going to be playing that for you today. This is just really cool. I mean, imagine that you have an an idea for a business and you don't want to go $100,000 in debt to start it. You want to use lean startup principles and you want to get a coach, someone to walk you through it so you don't have to make all those mistakes from scratch. Who are you going to call, right? And in my mind, it's obvious that Alan is the guy. I mean, what he's doing over at Pop-Up Business School is nothing short of transformational, you know, for the communities that he's working in. I've said it's my life's mission to go on a world tour with him and just see him in action, teaching people how to start up their businesses just totally from scratch. And it just completely transforms communities. It transforms neighborhoods. It's just, this is such valuable information. And I love to see this get more mainstream attention. And so Alan is basically bringing all those principles that he teaches over those classes, and he's going to funnel it into Talis's idea. And then we're going to be unpacking it here on the show today and over the course of a couple shows over 2018 and possibly 2019. And today we are now going to be playing the first of those coaching calls. And I think it's just a wonderful way to start off the new year. Yeah. Without any further ado, welcome to the Choose FI Radio podcast. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. All right, guys. Well, this is going to be a really fun episode. It's a little bit less formal. It's not going to have the normal structure of an interview. Rather, it's more of a coaching call where the curtain's being pulled back and you're being able to look at the nuts and bolts of how to start a business. And to help me with this today, I have my co-host, Brad, and I have Alan Donegan. But on top of that, Talis is going to be joining us on the show today, and we're going to be talking about her idea for a for a business. And so with that, Talis, welcome to the podcast. Would you mind taking a few minutes and telling us a little bit about yourself and your backstory? Yeah, I'm Talis Drew. I live in Iowa, originally from the Des Moines area, and I now live in uh, Cedar Rapids. I'm a ballroom dance instructor by trade. I went back to school recently to get my master's in dance choreography and focused my thesis for my master's on dance for people with Parkinson's disease. It's something that's been close to me with my family. My father has Parkinson's, and I know a few others do in this community as well. So I offer classes for people with Parkinson's disease to kind of promote awareness for them and how exercise is truly, really beneficial for their progress through the disease. And it's also something that is both my passion and and something that I've done for a living for a long time. So it's pretty easy for me to bring dance, specifically social styles, ballroom styles to that specific need. But I also have a son. I have a little boy who's about 17 months old. So that takes part of my time. I stay home with him part time. And then I also run another side business as well. So I don't have to go into detail on that, but that's pretty much kind of um, what I do in life right now. So 
how do you think that we can best help you? Like what has been, I guess the, the roadblocks that you felt like this is specifically what I would need help with to get this thing off the ground. So I teach one class per week here in this community where I live. Beyond that, uh, since graduating a year, not even a year and a half ago um, with my master's, I've been asked to speak at a few conferences on the topic of dance for Parkinson's disease. Because of those speaking opportunities, I've had the idea that I would like to go to other communities within the state, within the region, nationwide eventually to offer this, to teach other people who either already have an interest in physical therapy or teaching dance and would like to do it or just training somebody, you know, from scratch on how to offer this class to to other people that are, that have the same need. That kind of came from some questions that I would receive when I was speaking. And I really haven't made a ton of action steps going forward to, to make that happen. I have connections in other cities within the state that would be pretty quick to offer a class in those communities. But beyond that, that's, really where I am. I'm just focusing on teaching this one class right now and making it as good as I possibly can. Alan, do you want to hop in here? Yeah. So what's the benefit of the dance classes to the people with Parkinson's? How does it help them? Sure. First and foremost, kind of the the obvious benefit is exercise. There's this adage, if you you don't use it, you'll lose it. For Parkinson's, that's very much the case. They need to keep their bodies active. They need to keep creating new neural pathways with their muscles and their joints to ensure that they can have as much longevity in physical motion as possible. The other thing that I think is extremely beneficial, particularly with dance, is the use of music. When we pair music with any sort of exercise or physical activity, it stimulates a different part of the brain and that allows them to kind of make a connection to what they're doing in more of a creative way. And then the third benefit that I really stress is the social aspect. So not only are these people coming and doing something for their own physical bodies, but they're getting out of their homes and making a choice to be interacting with other people in a social way. And it also, I've found, holds them accountable to be there every week because they want to be there for the other people that are going through the same thing they are. So those are the three major benefits. So next question. We've sort of traveled around the world and helped everyone from the biggest organization in the world right down to the to individuals launching business and there's a similarity between the problems they all face from the person who's got social anxiety problems and just wants to make a bit of money all the way up to the billion dollar company and the thing that sort of ties them all together is defining who they're selling to so I think the question that I'd really love to know, Talis, is who's going to pay for this? Who's your customer? Who's going to buy it? Right. The way that I am funded now, I am paid to teach these classes is through a local chapter of the American Parkinson's Disease Association. So that chapter does fundraising. We got connected somehow and they devote part of their funding toward offering these classes to anybody and everybody that could benefit. I've also been in connection with some health organizations in the Des Moines area who have already expressed the desire to provide funding for these classes. So I think my customer is either these local chapters or some sort of a medical institution that wants to, for example, there's a healthy living center in the Des Moines area that partners with YMCA and they pay to offer these kinds of classes for special needs populations. So Parkinson's being one of them, people with MS, amputees, things like that. So I guess to answer your question, it would be probably these organizations versus directly the people that they serve. Have you tried the people you serve? Uh, To get them to pay for it out of pocket? Mm. Is that what you're asking? Yes. No, I haven't. Cool. Cool. Is there anyone else that's expressed an interest in supporting you financially? The university where I graduated, they have some grant programs, so they've already been willing to do that. Cool. Is there any research that's been done to back up the benefits you've told us? Certainly, yes. There's a pretty successful trial running right now at St. Louis University on, they're really like hyper-focusing on the benefits of tango, uh, specifically Argentine tango for 
people with Parkinson's, but there's a lot of crossover from that to other ballroom styles. That's kind of getting the most attention right now, but I know that there are other studies as well. Yeah, and they very cleverly taglined it, tango for Parkinson's. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And they've used that word to get people excited. Awesome. So we have good research to prove that what we're doing works. Uh, We have some people already funding it. And at the moment, we're giving the workshops away, which sounds very much exactly like the business model we use, which is we get people to fund it and then we go and do the workshops for the people who need it the most. Right. And I love that. I think it's a brilliant model. So two thoughts for you. One is, how much would you like to be the person running the workshops versus how much would you like to be the educator who teaches people to run it in other areas? Oh, that's a good question. (laughs) Can I say both? (laughs) (laughs) Of course you can. Well, that's what you do, isn't it, Alan? (laughs) That's pretty much what I do, definitely. Um, Although we're only just expanding into teaching other people how to do it. And there's an element of you need to have it working yourself and prove it, and then you can start spreading that to other areas. Sure. Well, I know my strength is in teaching. I definitely wouldn't want to give that up, but I'd like to be overseeing the entire process as well of building this out. Is there anyone else in the market at the moment doing what you're doing? No, not in this area. Have you searched nationally? Yes. And I know that there are other people doing it nationally. Cool. So what makes your workshops, courses and classes different to the other people who are doing it? I don't know that there is another individual who has expertise specifically in ballroom dancing. Um, There are other programs that utilize ballet, jazz, some other forms of dance. But I really believe in the benefits of, of social partnering. And pulling from those styles, and from what I've found, there aren't other programs that offer strictly a ballroom-focused class for this community. And what are the ages of the people that come along to your workshops? And I'm thinking, are they interested in ballroom dancing? Yeah, so anywhere from about 50 to 75. This also includes their spouses or caregivers. The class is open to... Um, those people as well. And yes, I mean, these people all watch Dancing with the Stars and they're, you know, very interested in just um, learning to dance. Some of them are old enough to have had dancing experience in their younger days as well. So some of them, it's kind of a nostalgia thing. They're like, oh, I, I used to do this, you know, when I was younger or before Parkinson's. And it's kind of bringing it back. Awesome. So I've got a couple of thoughts for you. One is, When you're thinking about a business, one of the mistakes I made in my early days was I went out and I tried to sell entrepreneur workshops to schools Mm -hmm. and uh, schools in the UK don't have much money. So I spent an entire year trying to sell workshops to people with no real money to pay for it. And not only that, they also thought they did it themselves because they had business lecturers and economics lecturers. And it was my biggest, it was my worst financial year altogether. So when you're selling something, there has to be someone with cash in the equation mm-hmm. and preferably with a lot of cash to help you to be able to do what you want to do. Right. And not only do they need cash, but they also need to have the same desire to fix the problem or alleviate the problem that you want to fix as well. One of the examples was that would be uh, there was a guy that wanted to do talks and mini workshops for victims of cancer or cancer sufferers. He was thinking, I don't want to make them pay for it. I want to get someone else to pay for it. And then I want to give it away for free. So his first thought was who in this equation would have money? Who do you think would have money to fund that sort of program? Hospital. Yeah, hospitals is definitely one avenue and they have some money. And if it fixes the problem and saves them money, they may be interested. That's not who we actually went for. 
who has the most money in that particular situation and an image problem? The American Cancer Society. <laughs> I'm not sure about their image problem. Uh, the one he ended up with was pharmaceutical companies. Oh, okay. I, I had my hand raised in the background. You couldn't see it. I was yeah. I was waving uh-huh. over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, the American Cancer Society has had a couple image problems of recent, but anyway, yeah. Yeah. So the one he got, they definitely had money, and they definitely had an image problem that they needed fixing. And by doing something good in the community, they got their image fixed. He well assisted with. He got the money to fund his problem and uh, fund his program and do what he wanted to, and the people got the support for nothing. So what we need to do is look for you. Who's got the money and the desire to help your audience? And is there something that we can give them in return for helping those people? So can we make them look good? Can we give them publicity? Can we give them access to people? Uh, and those are the kind of things that then bring in those sponsors to run those programs. I feel like sure. that was a, a light bulb moment just just right there. I mean, I think that just from the outside looking in, you start with who who's going to pay for this? But like that realization, there's almost an endless supply of money when you look where to point. And as you were saying that, I'm visualizing companies like Pfizer and some of these other, you know, high tier pharmaceutical manufacturers that are even frankly, they're pushing medications that they think might be helpful for those, for those different Mm -hmm. disease states. And those are all in the pipeline, but the idea of their image, nothing is more powerful than their public perception, their public image. So it it seems like that funding problem almost immediately got a lot easier. Sure. So for our courses, our workshops that we run, we have a range of different funders who all have different interests. We have In the UK, something called housing associations, which are social landlords, they want their residents to earn their own money, become self-sufficient for two primary reasons. One is if they're building a business doing what they love, they're not off doing other antisocial behaviours. And two is that they'll be able to pay their rent. So they fund us to run the courses because it gives something to them. The councils fund us because it economically develops the community and we build businesses who grow and employ people and then eventually pay taxes. And then we get corporate sponsors and we've also got some shopping malls that sponsor us with space and money to run the events. The shopping malls sponsor us for several reasons. One is it brings people into the shopping centre. So the shops around where we're running the workshops see an increase in sales because there's more people in the shopping centre. Two is it makes them look good and they get great publicity and press. And the shopping centres we worked in with in England were seen in the press one point by 1.9 million people last year. So it gave them some great PR. The third reason is it gives them closer relationships with the council who offer planning permission for their next developments. So they fund us to do the workshops and they are doing it altruistically. Equally, they need to get something back. Otherwise, they wouldn't continue to do it. So I'm thinking, who can we find or who would fund it that has some of these problems that they need fixing or something that they need support with? I'm going to have to do a little research on that. (laughs) You mean you can't say off the top of your head immediately? (laughs) I can't, no. Um, (laughs) I think there are definitely opportunities to connect with some of these other companies that have been involved in these conferences throughout the year. I mean, there there are drug companies there with representatives as well. So, and there are different um, groups popping up. There are people pushing these bikes and, and different equipment related things for people with Parkinson's. So there are some some different things there to look into. That's interesting. So there's two thoughts there. One is the conferences that you've been asked to speak at, have a look at their list of sponsors. And that will give you a list of people to target and talk to. And the second one is the companies that supply equipment for the audience that you support Quite often they're looking for routes to get their product or service in front of the audience that you support. 
which is the people with Parkinson's, the carers and the family members. If you can find one of those that you believe in truly, and then we can do a partnership deal to get their product in front of your audience and they fund the workshops and you're happy that their products actually add value to these people's lives, that could be an incredible way of securing the funding you need to roll your program out statewide. Sure. Yeah. So I think our number one mission is to come up with a list of people that we want to approach to secure funding and then let's write a pitch together and then go and approach them and see if we can find you funding to run your program. All right. So what are you going to sell them? What am I going to sell to them? Yeah. What are they going to buy? The opportunity to get their product in front of an audience in a more intimate way. Cool. Anything else? <laughs> sure. Um, let's see. <laughs> I mean, just kind of a better exposure, going back to that idea of kind of changing their image, maybe if it's a piece of equipment that, you know, is supposed to benefit the longevity of physical exercise, they can, you know, have a pretty visual way to demonstrate that if they're partnering with a dance workshop so that customers can see, you know, the application of that device or whatever piece of equipment it might be. Absolutely. Uh, And there's something I'd like to share with you, uh, which I'll send you via email. After every pop-up business school or an event, we write a report detailing what we have achieved that we send to each of the funders. It's just an infographic thing with lots of pictures and diagrams, but it shows them that For example, last year in our Croydon event, that we've just finished this year's version, last year we had 183 people along to the two-week workshop, and I think it was 34% of them had made their first sale before the end of the workshop. So they get this report that says who comes along, what they achieved. We set up, I think it was 75 or 80 businesses inside a fortnight, and we showed who we'd been helping and what we've done. So I think there's some some reporting back of what sure. you can do in terms of the the difference you're making to the people's feelings, the difference you make to the carers, the difference you make to the connection of the family to the person, the number of people that are following your information on Twitter and the exposure you get in press. And if we can start to collect some of these numbers and to instantiate what we are doing, that gives us the data to be able to back up what we're doing and to sell more. Sure. Makes sense. Yeah. So I'll send you our report. You can have a look. It's a slightly different subject, but I think it'll give you an idea of what we do. And these reports are then what sells the next one and what sells the next one. Sure. And would that be in the, could she collect that data in the form of a survey that people take either by email or that she, there's a handout or something along those lines that she gives to participants in her different classes that she's teaching now to collect that data? I think that's a great way of doing it. We kind of do a pre-survey and a post-survey. Uh, we use SurveyMonkey to do it, but you could pretty much do it on a sheet of paper. We do employment status before and employment status afterwards because that's a very clear metric for what we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. But we also have, in England, we call it social value. So what's the social good that your program achieves? And we have several indicators of that. We ask people's happiness levels before and after courses. We ask them their confidence levels before and after courses. And we find that people's happiness and confidence goes a from around, on average, four and a half to about eight and a half out of 10 following our workshops. And we're able to show, yeah, it's self-surveyed, so it's people's own opinions. However, we're able to show numerically that we make people happier and we build confidence. And I think you could easily show that your dance classes help people to feel more positive have a better connection with their partners i think you could easily show some numbers and some stats that are self-reported about how people feel before or afterwards and i yeah, think that would yeah. be fascinating to go to funders with talis it strikes me that you're, you're already doing this right i mean you're already doing workshops with people 
And, and essentially yeah. this is a conversation about how to take it to the next level. So I would imagine that you've already acquired a good amount of goodwill with the community that you're working with, right? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was curious. So what Alan is suggesting in large degree, I bet you, Alan, do you create a list? Do you have an email list? We do indeed. Yeah. Part of this conversation, when you're talking about how the practical application of what Alan is doing, he's able to do this because he has a list. And so figuring out a very subtle way of starting to build that list, especially since you have a physical product, not like a, a digital page at this point, I would imagine mm-hmm. it's going to be a big piece of this puzzle. Yeah. You're talking about just uh, building a list of, of attendees so that I can you know, share these surveys with them and have that access to collecting the data. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. And I'm, well, I guess what I'm not saying is it's an email list. I mean, how are you reaching these people? How are you getting them to take action and do this survey monkey? You know, how are you, when they walking out, how are you like following up with them saying, was this good for you? How can we improve? Do you feel like your confidence is better? You know, all those sorts of things, Alan, that all comes down to, you're able to do that because you've, you have a way of reaching them. We actually do it whilst they're in the room. So what I've found is that people don't respond to you via email and they don't often fill out the surveys afterwards and it needs to be done whilst they're in the room. So I guess, how long are your programs, Talis? Are they a set of workshops or is it an ongoing thing? It's an ongoing hour-long weekly meeting. Cool. So maybe what you could do for the new joiners is do a, a little paper thing or a paper survey when they come in. And then after two or three months, you can do a per- paper survey when they leave or a survey monkey just right there and then asking them questions and type them in. That then gives us a very, very basic longitudinal study to say before Talis worked with them, here's where they were. And after we worked with them, here's where we were. And compared to the average person who hasn't been through it, this is the difference we've made. Right. So one thing that I actually do with my students who are, I'll call them regulars, is I did have them fill out an assessment you know, at the beginning of the class, this was about a year ago, just as kind of an onboarding process. And then I let them know that as long as they are my student, I will provide them feedback on what I see in terms of balance, choreography, retention, and just kind of like overall mood and involvement in the class. So, you know, on a very small scale, that's easy for me to do because I have a number of students that I can, you know, there's, 12 or so regular people that I can check in with on a monthly basis and give them the feedback. And so I, that would be another question is how can I take that little system and scale it as well so that that could be part of these workshops moving forward for other teachers to use so that they are offering not only, you know, kind of a one hour fun activity for these people to enjoy, but then they're also getting this feedback from a little bit more of a medical perspective on, you know, this is how the class I see is affecting you. And I'm not a medical professional, so I keep it very related to the material in the class and what my expertise is in my dance training. But I've found that they appreciate that feedback. So that's just kind of another piece of it. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love that. And so what I will do is I will send you a link to a blank survey that we use before and after the workshop to give you an idea of how we collect our data. When I first did these workshops, the question I always got asked was, how do you know it works? That was the one that I really struggled to answer because I knew it worked anecdotally. I had the stories. I could tell you, uh, Dennis built his this business and he sold this food and Tony made this much money in his first year. And I could tell you anecdotally the examples, but I had no numbers. And in a sales situation, the magic formula or combination is stats and stories. Mm -hmm. So if we can have some stats that show that people are happier, more confident, more engaged, whatever it is, what the things you actually change. And then we can have the individual stories of the people that back it up. That's the magic combination. So I guess, how could we measure whether your workshops work or not? How can we measure if the dance classes work? What What's the questions or numbers we need to ask? Well, I think kind of similar to what you were asking your participants is, you know, what, how's their mood before and how's their mood after? Is it Is it changing them emotionally? Are they leaving the class um, in a better mood? Are they glad that they came? That would be 
boil down probably into one question, but I think that that's part of it. And then also what I mentioned about actually tracking the physical progress. You know, people are just coming to have something to do with their time, but then others are really, really um, proactive on maintaining their physical ability. So they appreciate more than others that uh, response of, yes, I see that your balance is improving. I see that you know, today was a really good day because you were on with the beat and those kinds of things. So I would really love to be able to show that as well, show that there is an actual physical takeaway for these people, that it's not just something fun, but it is it does make a difference in their ability to move throughout the rest of their day and hopefully beyond that. I love that. And I'm going to suggest a way of doing it that is completely wrong in the hope that it will spark the right idea for you. Is there a random test like standing on one leg with your eyes closed that proves it's working, that if they could do that for longer by the end of working with you, you kind of shown that it's maintaining their their physical abilities that help them throughout the day? And that's probably completely the wrong thing. But I'm wondering if, what ideas it sparks for you. Yeah, that's for drunk driving. But no, no. <laughs> <laughs> We would probably, yes, there's definitely something, you know, and I haven't thought about it like that in in that specific way, but I'm sure that I can come up with something that would just be kind of a, yeah, for lack of a better term, a quick test um, to provide that analysis. So, yeah. Which then gives us the, the actual proof that what we're doing works or proof enough to be able right. to do it. And that will give us a fantastic review. One last thought is, you said that they do it with their carers and their partners and their family that come along and do the dancing in teams. Does yes. it create a better yeah. connection with them? Um, you know, I, I perceive that it does. There are certainly people that come alone. So not everybody comes with a partner. And then there are couples, you know, married couples that come every week together. One has Parkinson's and one doesn't. And what's so interesting to me is that in most cases, these people are about the same age in life, and they they tend to struggle with the same things in class. So sometimes, because I'm a, a ballroom instructor instructor that teaches you know all kinds of adults with or without disabilities, I sometimes forget in my Parkinson's class that I'm teaching people with Parkinson's, and I'm not just teaching a regular ballroom dance class. And I say that because there will be the spouses or caregivers that don't have Parkinson's and they'll be saying, Oh, this is so difficult. Can you go over that again? I'm really struggling with this step pattern. And I'm reminded that dance is something that is foreign to a lot of people. And it really has nothing to do with having a disease. So going back to your question, yes, I think that that bonding is created because it kind of equalizes the playing field for that particular couple. They come to class and the person with Parkinson's can see that they're not the only one struggling with the material, their spouses as well. And they can kind of forget for a moment that there's this difference between them in that way. And that right there to me sounds like the absolutely immeasurably valuable thing that we need to measure. Mm -hmm. Because that's why, like that is worth, you can't put a price on that. That's worth so much to the people coming to your courses to connect better forget it's happened and to be together again on an equal playing for field. Yeah. I think that's incredible. Yeah. I feel um, like a lot of your messaging should be teed around that. I mean, that was, that felt really powerful when you were saying it, just this idea that you're for, you're shifting the paradigm instead of this, like you said, this caretaker caregiver, right? That's the, that's the paradigm that people have gotten used to. Instead, you're, you're moving that to partners again. And how refreshing is that? Yeah, certainly. I think I take it for granted because I witness it all the time, but it's great to hear you guys say that. And I think that's, yeah, you're right. We should target the messaging around that for sure. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's great. I think that's fantastic. If you can give that to someone, that is an incredible gift. I'm so excited that I feel like I made a contribution. I'm going to go on break now. <laughs> <laughs> Very impressive. Very impressive. I'm here to I'm help. Sitting here, I'm I'm sitting here listening the whole time, and uh, <laughs> this is great, though, guys. Yeah, no kidding. Hey, Alan, I have a question for you, if, if you don't mind. So, yeah. you know, we talked about adding value to the people who would potentially be funding these classes, right? So, where does PR come into this? So, 
ballroom dancing for people with Parkinson's is a very feel good story. Certainly, I could see this being something that local news would pick up. At what point in the process does that become something that Talis does in conjunction with trying to get these other sponsors or companies on board? To get PR takes energy and time to create the relationships with the right editor, the right writer, the right broadcaster who will want to do the story. It creates fantastic credibility and it's one of the quickest ways to build credibility. And you'll see this on so many people's websites as seen in Forbes magazine, as seen on uh, this new channel, as seen on this. Uh, and that builds amazing credibility for what you're doing. Like the holy grail of that stuff would be to get you on the Oprah Winfrey show or the someone that really cares about this stuff and could help share the message. That would be the kind of big PR, which would definitely then allow us to get the sponsors at a larger level. Mm -hmm. We do need to sort of work on it to show the stories and examples. We managed to get ourselves featured on the BBC News and the primary feedback from the news reporter who was doing the piece was that he didn't care who our sponsors were. He didn't care about any of the businesses that were involved. He cared about the people and the stories of the individuals. And it was those individual stories that made the PR piece, not the big sponsors and the big numbers. We had this lovely lady called Tasha, who was, I think, 25. She'd been unemployed for six years and she said live on the BBC that she would never work for anyone else. And she was a colourful character, full of energy, talking about setting up her own business, never want to work for anyone else. And that brought the story to life. And then he contrasted that with a, a fabulous lady called Dolores that was making Caribbean food earn more in retirement. And it was those people and that the people that made the story. So I think if we're going to go and get press for you, it's the people and the individual stories about the benefits it had and the way it's changed their lives. And you can film them dancing together. And that's yeah. what would make the story that would get us in front of the right people. And that definitely then gives us the proof that we have the PR reach to be able to then get some sponsors. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I actually already have some footage um, that I packaged for my thesis concert. And I interviewed the people in my class. They talked about the benefits. And then there was a couple, husband and wife from my class, that agreed to, we, they went to the same middle school. And we went to that middle school. And I filmed them dancing together in the school gym. And then they actually performed that piece live at my show. And I'm just thinking about kind of these little pieces that we already have that I might be able to pull out and use for something just on a local level of starting to build that PRP. I love that. Do you have a website, tell us? I don't, not for this. I have a Facebook page, Parkinson's Dance Project, but I haven't honestly done much with it at all. So it's there, but I do not have a website for this right now. Cool. But you've got a, a Facebook page, but not a website, a Twitter account? No. Cool. Uh, Brad and Jonathan, I think website building should be a feature of one episode that we can do a bit together. Yeah, I'm excited um, about that. And I think, Talis, we should build a website together live. Um, yeah, I have built and I'm currently still working on a website through Wix. I don't know what platform you like to use, but I've used Wix and I'm pretty comfortable with it. That's for another business, but... I don't, I mean, whatever you suggest is fine, but I have some experience just with those like drag and drop, you know, easy builders. That's exactly what we recommend. And we use the one called Weebly. It's kind okay. of similar. So yeah, it's a drag and drop builder. It's very similar, whichever one you're comfortable with. The only reason we recommend Weebly is it's because it's the one our own website's built on. Um, okay. Yeah, we have no affiliation to them other than the fact that it works for us. And it's worked quite well for our participants. Um, but it's a similar thing, a drag and drop builder. And that then gives us some reach and some PR and some stories about what you're doing. 
that's going to be fun. Do you have some photos of your classes that we could use for the website? Certainly. Excellent. I feel like we're getting to a plan of action. Yeah, it feels like it. So what do you think, Talis? What do you think the top actions and plans are that we should go for? I don't think it would hurt to get a start there on the website and pulling in the photos and videos that I already have. And then I want to get a jump on making that list of people from the conference to maybe contact in terms of providing a sponsorship or doing a a partnership deal on providing some workshops. Um, I'm also going to put together a list, um, kind of consolidate my list of contacts in the other cities, people that have reached out to me throughout Iowa to asking for me to come and teach a class. So it's nice that those asks are there. So I'd like to put all of that together and kind of, I don't know, build like a tour in a sense of what that might look like if I were to start piloting this in other cities, how I could map that out. I love the idea of a statewide tour. I think that's a fantastic idea. Yeah, it's pretty easy to do in Iowa. Could I mean, almost do it in a day. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds just like England. Probably. Um, <laughs> so the people with Parkinson's, do they get cared for at home or are they in actual sort of uh, community homes or how does it work in America? Um, no, I mean, here typically... In these kinds of programs, these people are still pretty independent. They live at home with their families, and a lot of them still drive. It's not until very, very late stage in the disease that they might need some sort of a an in-home care, you know, hospice kind of situation. I mean, that's really, really late. But the majority of these people that are coming to these classes, mine and exercise classes or aquatic classes for people with Parkinson's, they're all still living at home and they may still be working part-time. Most of them are retired because they're at that point in their lives anyway, but they're still pretty independent in terms of going places. Cool. So you're going to be a little bit like us. Uh, We have broadly in our business, two types of customers. The customer number one is the people that fund our workshops the councils, the housing associations, and the corporate sponsors. Mm -hmm. And customer number two are the people who come on our courses who want help starting businesses and making money doing something they enjoy. Mm -hmm. Uh, And each one, we need a completely different pitch for to get them along. And I need a different list as well. Um, Part of my thought of asking that question is, where can we find, because you need both sides, you need the people with parkinson's to come along to the classes so that we can actually help people and then we need the funders to pay for it and without either one of those groups it doesn't work sure you know what's interesting is this has really nothing to do with parkinson's but because of my role in teaching ballroom over the last several years i've gotten many requests to go to retirement facilities and offer a class for their residents these places tend to have a lot of extra cash that they want to throw around for activities. I don't know what their fund is called, but it's, you know, they call and they say, whatever your price is, please come teach an hour, two hour workshop. We'll pay you. Our residents love ballroom dancing. They love dancing with the stars, et cetera. I wonder if there's an opportunity there to offer something on location at their site that's open to their residents that maybe don't have Parkinson's, but we could invite people with Parkinson's to come. And it would be for them an opportunity to showcase their residential space to people that might end up needing to move there at some point with their spouse or without. So I I literally am just thinking of this, but I don't know how that sounds to you. I think it seems like an opportunity because I know that the the money is, is there in most cases. There's a lot of pretty big retirement facilities here that have extra funds to throw around, it seems. So... Uh, my initial thought is genius. And not just retirement facilities, but advanced aging facilities where it's like progressive care, you know? Yeah. I think that is a genius idea. And you're absolutely right. We can get it funded. We can invite local people who are still independent in to do the dance classes to have fun, plus run it for their residents. Uh, that would build awareness, get us the funding to run the classes. I think that is brilliant. 
The other half of that is with the advanced aging facilities or the progressive care facilities, their marketing tool to the people that are coming in is that it, the community is involved. That that's mm-hmm. the whole pitch. So they've already they're already taking care of the community pitch for you. Now they've got to fulfill their promises. They've got to fulfill their marketing. So sure. you're serving them by make lowering the barrier to fostering this idea of community. Mm-hmm. I love that idea. Yeah, I think we should get a list of these retirement communities. And we should write them a letter and then give them a call and see if we can do it. And if you've got a list of the ones that have already reached out to you, I think that's a brilliant way to start. And also, as opposed to cold calling, I've just I've just noticed this. I had to set up flu clinics, flu shot clinics as a pharmacist when I was doing it. And I just found that after I had one or two asking me or after I I had accepted an invite, when I was cold calling these other businesses, if I just said, hey, we're going to do a flu shot clinic, you know, they they were kind of skeptical. But if I said, hey, we're, we've already partnered with your sister chapters here, here, and here. They want us to come in and do a flu shot clinic. And I figure while wow, we're out and about, you know, adapt this to your own purposes, get your own mileage out of it. But the idea that, hey, everybody else is doing this fear of missing out, you probably want us to do this too. It tends to make that conversation a lot easier. Social Definitely. proof, right? Yeah. Yeah. At a different, at a physical level, but yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Tell us, I feel like your list of things to do is growing ever longer. <laughs> How do you feel about this? <laughs> no, I think it's awesome. That's that's great. I was hoping that would be the case. Yeah, and I was brainstorming, and I feel like we've got some fantastic ways to start. So we can start on the website. We can make a list of the conference sponsors and the corporate sponsors. We can put together a list of the contacts in the other cities around Iowa and look at doing a statewide tour. We can collect some data to or work out the questions to ask to get the data we need to prove that what we're doing works. And then we can also look at the retirement communities and the progressive care facilities. I think that is a fantastic win-win proposal that you just came up with. I really do. I think that's one that we should definitely pitch. And I have some thoughts on branding since you guys are talking about website design as one of our to-do lists. Should we do that now or do you want to save that for later, Alan? What, have thoughts on branding? Yeah, I mean, if you're going to, if she's going to go get a website, I mean, are you assuming she's going to get a domain as well? Our general advice is to go for a free one to start with. Do you have a domain, Talis? No, I don't. Okay. Cool. So, so your domain is going to be tied to your brand. And I, I have some thoughts that I've, I've, you know, I landed on ChooseFi. I'm still very happy with that. And I'd love to just give you my two cents on how to go about thinking through a brand name choice, because keep in mind, you're going to be tied to this on upwards of 10 different platforms, right? Your Facebook page, your Twitter feed, your domain address. It's going to follow you all over the internet. And I heard some pretty sharp advice from, I believe it was Seth Godin and basically talking about when you're selecting your name, you're thinking through how do, how do I go about selecting my, my brand name? There's two obvious places to go. You could be super explicit with what you say, like for instance, let's say you fix computers, you could choose the domain, assuming it's available, ifixcomputers.com. And there's two sides of that coin. One is that it's very obvious what you're doing, so it makes it easier for people to find you. But also as your brand continues to develop, it kind of diminishes the value of your brand. Now on the other side of that, you could pick something that's totally tangential or not at all related to your product. But then if you become the clear leader in your space, it actually carries more weight. So like Apple, or target. Like when I said, Apple, you didn't think of a fruit, right? If I said Amazon, you're not thinking of a, a, you're not thinking of some jungle princess. They have completely defined their product and has nothing to do with maybe the original origin of the word. So that's kind of the two different ways to approach your branding. And then when you're thinking about, you know, what can I get that's a com, which I'm a big fan of, if you can lock. Now I realize you have a physical product, so that's a little different. It's not, it's not quite as important that you rank from an SEO perspective, but in terms of picking that, Almost all of the one words, all the single words, I think almost every single single word in the English language is taken, but you pretty much have your pick of two and three word combinations. So the question is, how close do you want to get? What's that line? How close do you want to get to your final product? And then what's available as a two and a three word combination? So, you know, you could take that for what it's worth, but it's, it's clearly, it's a good exercise to fill up a page with just clever two and three word combinations that fit ballpark what you're trying to accomplish and then find something that that is subtle but maybe you know but that kind of fits that void that we're looking for Mm -hmm. alan at what point in the process do you generally talk about this so a name is good to get going straight away 
My thoughts about the second way of doing it, which is having a completely tangential name, such as moonpig.com or... You stole that from me. I was going to suggest that. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, my thoughts are those people tend to have a lot of budget to throw at advertising to get their name out there. And our recommendation is to go along the more simpler line to start with. Do you have a name for your course at the moment? Is it the Parkinson's Dance Project? Yeah, so that's the Facebook page that I have. But actually, the course is called PD Moves. You know, PD as in Parkinson's disease, shortened and then moves. I don't know if that's available. I honestly haven't even looked in terms of a, a domain. But Go that's find out. how we reference the class. Are you <laughs> you're looking at it right now? Go find out, yeah. I can do it. I don't know how fast I can do it, but Wait, I'm going to try. Just, uh, hey, dude, don't, don't search that yet. Jonathan, if you go to GoDaddy, yeah. sometimes if you search something and don't buy it, somebody will somebody, snap it up. Can they see that yeah. search? People have a way of doing that. Yeah, yeah, you're not wrong. I know that anytime we've thought of a domain on the show, we went ahead and grabbed it because we're like, that's not going to be there a week from now. Yeah. So, Alan, how do I go about getting a domain for free? The website builder we normally recommend is Weebly, Weebly.com. You can get a free website from them. And it will have dot weebly dot com in oh. the title. Yeah. So it will be Parkinson's Dance Project dot weebly dot com. Right. Now the first impression most people have is I don't want to do that because I don't want a dot weebly dot com in the title. No one will ever take me seriously. The reason Weebly do it is because you get a free website and they get advertised and it spreads the word about what they're doing. Two things. One is that The name you come up with to start with, you might go through a couple of iterations and you end up spending quite a lot of money on domain names. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask Brad and Jonathan in a minute how addicted they are to buying domain names uh, and how much money they've spent on it. But I know a lot of people who've started a lot of businesses, me included, that bought up a load of domain names and then never ended up using them. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I think Jonathan, do you have a moment here (laughs) to tell us how much money you've spent on domain names? I'm probably the rarity in that I have a pretty good execution rate. I'd actually be curious. I'll tell you about mine, but I'm curious to get Brad's input because he's been in the online space for (laughs) a lot longer. Yeah, I've certainly bought 10 to 20 names that I've never used and had some grand plans for. But yeah, I just usually buy them for a year. And when I don't use them, I just let them slip away. But yeah, that's a couple hundred bucks just completely wasted. Yeah, Choose FI was one of my first, and obviously that's been good to me. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I had a couple other projects going in the background, still do. I have another blog that's a personal finance blog that I won't disclose the name of at this point because I am probably going to have something going on in the background there with that. Um, I have another one called ATK Gadgets. It was this idea that maybe I could riff off of the America's Test Kitchen brand and create a like a product review site that had different kitchen gadgets and reviews and that sort of thing. And then maybe I could turn that into just a comp, you know, an e-commerce site that one I haven't done anything with. I don't know that I will do anything with, and I actually see a a legal problem potentially there in that, let's say it did blow up and it had a ton of traffic. I could see America's test kitchen come in and saying you're infringing on our, you're taking advantage of our trademark because it's just ATK plus gadgets at the end. And then I heard Pat Flynn got into a little trouble with something similar. So I might actually let that one slip. And then the third one that we purchased and we actually purchased a couple iterations of it was this idea. It was a second gen com. We actually came up with the idea while we were recording a podcast. <laughs> and then as soon as we were done recording, went and go checked it out and it was all available because it's a three word combination. So I purchased two to three of those because I think that we talk about it enough that I could see us, even if I don't do it, I could delegate that out or let someone else have that domain. But I think we're building enough value around it that it's worth doing. So uh, what is that? Three out of five. And I guess, so my bias is as long as you take the time and you come up with a clever brand, you know, as as long as you don't wing that, then you're not going to need to iterate as much. And I'm a big fan of locking it down and locking down every single application of it across the internet. So the bit we have is, I've set up quite a few businesses and they don't always go well. And then I end up doing different versions. When I have got one that I've actually loved, I've bought the domain name, but I've generally started them for free later on 
one of the most successful participants we ever had on the pop-up business school was at the first one we ever had in Western Supermare. His name was Tony Pass and he was a retail consultant. So he'd go into shops and he'd tell the staff to smile at their customers and where to lay out the stock and how to use Twitter to get more customers in and all that stuff. Uh, he set up a free website, which was the retailoperation.weebly.com. And with that free website, he managed to get himself on the pay first page of the Google rankings for the term retail consultant in the UK. And he landed two national retail brands in his first year, turning over uh, over £100,000. He made incredible progress, and it was through a dot .weebly dot com address and if you'll notice the ecuador chautauqua is on a dot weebly dot com address so is the uk chautauqua there's quite a few out there and i don't think it deters people so my preference is let's get going for free and once we've decided we actually like the name in a few months time we go okay now we're ready to actually buy it that's kind of how we get going Equally, we're tending to try and get people to get going who don't have any money at all. Uh, so buying even a domain name is a bit of a stretch sometimes. So if you've got the money and we come up with a good, good name, then maybe we just go for it. I guess I wanted to say is that it shouldn't be a barrier to get going. That kind of, um, I don't want to segue here if it's not the time, but I did want to ask you guys, that just made me think back to um, some questions I had for you. Alan and Brad and Jonathan for the podcast, what are your goals for this process on your end? And Alan, is it that we do this as free as possible to see how that goes? Or I wanted to check in to make sure that, you know, I'm participating in a way that promotes those goals as well. So can we ask that now? Yeah, of course. It's not, it don't, it's not super formal. There's no, there's certainly no legal contract in the background here. I mean, I don't know, Alan can outlay it, but our view is totally altruistic. We just want to help. Cool. Okay. And we've always had the thought that, you know, this contest would exist. And, and we've mentioned this certainly on the podcast that we would check in with you and Alan on X basis, you know, once a month, once every six weeks, whatever it is, and then have like a lesson that the audience can follow along with. So, I mean, that's clearly like our hope is that this is not just Talos building a, a business or a successful business, but potentially hundreds or thousands of people doing it along with you. So I think that that's always been my big goal is to have Alan's teachings get out on this regular basis to our audience. So yeah, I I certainly have nothing. I'm looking for nothing else other than this, other than that, that that's my big goal. Awesome. Cool. And from my side, I just thought it would be fun. Nice. I wanted to use that word. <laughs> <laughs> I went with altruistic well, I, and now I feel like the, uh, the screwball that like, could have just said fun. <laughs> you're, trying to, you're trying to improve your words, right? John? I, know, I need doing... better words. <laughs> <laughs> so I do I, have a, a talus. How frugal do we need to be when we're starting this business? I mean, well, I've already started it, but how frugal do we have to be when you're growing this business? Um, we don't have to be super frugal, but I think that it's, fun to challenge ways that we can be. I mean, I'm all about frugality if that's the route that makes sense. And when you were talking about the domain, if, if it makes sense to just get started with a free domain, why just throw some money at it? If we get to a, a point of like a holdup where I need to throw some money at it, then, then I can do that. If, I'd like to be in the interest of kind of going back to you know the podcast and helping as many people as possible. And I, I really believe in your product, Alan, and that uh, people should be able to start a business for free. So I if, I if there's a way that I can demonstrate that, then let's do it. I love that. Yeah. Let's start it for as little as possible. Let's then make lots of money and help lots of people and make the world a better place all in one go. And then go get yeah. tacos in that order. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Cool. Yeah. That sounds great. All right. Well, all right. So do you have your to-do list? Anything else? Yeah, you got a pretty long to-do list. Yeah, I have a list for sure. What do you think is a good timeline to kind of reconvene on this? Whatever works. I have a pretty flexible schedule. So what's your suggestion, Alan, on checking in? So Brad and Jonathan said about having sort of a, a mini lesson for the audience per time. I think the bit we've been going through today 
is what are you selling and who are you selling it to and what's the benefit? That's pretty much what we've done today. So maybe I'll do a wrap up with them where I summarize that at the end. I think the next one could be about websites and we build a platform or the next one could be about you've got the list of sponsors and the contacts in the city and the retirement communities. And then we come up with a pitch. Maybe that's the next one is how do you pitch it? But yeah, the basic list was the sponsors to approach the contacts in the different cities and the retirement communities to pitch to. We could probably do a whole sort of little bit on collecting the data to prove that what we're doing actually works. Mm-hmm. And then there's definitely a whole little bit on websites and building one together. There's definitely a bit of that, which I think Brad, Jonathan and I need to have a discussion about how we do that. Because, yeah, I'm not entirely sure how to do that. We yeah. could probably do it on a screen share, chatting it through together or something like that. Um, but it's a very visual one, building a website. And I've completely failed to answer your question of how long. I think it would be good if we could in maybe a couple of weeks or maybe a week or so to get the next one going to keep the energy. I've really enjoyed this. I think you have an incredible product and you have some great ideas and I'm up for getting going on this. Whatever works for you. Yeah, that works for me. So Alan, tell us, thank you so much for coming on today and, and, ha- and sharing this conversation with us. I think this is going to be valuable, not only for obviously for you, Talis, but also just to our audience that's kind of learning this stuff right along with us. Alan, do you have any final thoughts about the content that we talked about today? I think the final thought is the progress you make in your business is directly related to the clarity of which you can describe exactly who your customer is and how you're helping them and what you're selling them. And I think what we've been working on today with Talis is she's got two different customers that we need to sell to in two completely different ways. And that will help us to clearly get the sponsors and then also get the people along to the courses that we can help do it. So the most important thing for all of our listeners, if they're going to be doing businesses, is to work exactly who they're going to sell to. The more specific, the better. And very clearly, how they make those people's lives better. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alan. Talis, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you guys, all three of you so much. This is really exciting for me and um, I appreciate the opportunity a lot. This is going to be great. I can't wait to help you do it. And yeah, I can't wait to get into the social media, the promotion, the PR. We've got so much to talk about and we're going to do some cool stuff. Yeah, absolutely. This has been a blast. Very informative Talis, thanks so much, first of all, for just being a part of this community, for sharing your ideas with us and being willing to kind of let us help you at the margins. I think this is really going to come together over 2018, and I'm super excited to see where it goes. Alan, this, wow, man, absolutely. You're bringing so much to the table, and these are ideas and concepts that they inspire me, but they're also very, very new to me as well. So I I am learning right alongside with Talis and I think our audience is as well. To our audience, I hope you got value from this. I hope you enjoyed this. I know it's different than a lot of the episodes that we've done up to this point. And we've tried to be very intentional with giving you different types of information to let you think about what's that one next thing that I could take action on. And I think when you start considering what starting a business from scratch actually looks like uh, without all the risk that comes with taking out that $100,000 startup loan, this just becomes a much more fascinating conversation. And the FI community is so uniquely positioned to become entrepreneurs, either through starting a small side hustle or a full-time business venture by going into real estate. You know, it, it, it doesn't really matter which lane you choose, but the fact is you have life becomes a series of choices. You have all these options. And I think it's just really cool to see all of it come together. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you for being a part of our community. If you want to support us, here are four easy ways. One, leave us an iTunes review. If you want to do that, just go to chooseify.com slash iTunes. Two, use our page to sign up for travel credit cards. If you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to chooseify.com slash cards and get started today. 
Three, if you're working on the milestones of Phi, set up a personal capital account to track your progress and use our affiliate link. It's completely free. And just go to choosefi.com slash PC. P is in Paul, C is in Cat. And four, and most importantly, find your friends, coworkers, and family members who might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start with episode 38, The Why of Phi. And right behind that, have them go listen to episode 21, The Pillars of Phi. It is a fantastic starting place. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.